Have you been bitten by the BXT40 bug? I have, as have many others. This is my third video in the BITX40 mini-series and gives more of a review of the assembly process. First, I want to give credit where credit is due. Randy, K7AGE, piqued my interest while I was watching one of his excellent videos. My particular interest has to do with the many questions I get about locating an inexpensive and yet effective way to get on HF single sideband. First, a little more on construction and then on to test results. About the BITX40, it's a single band, 40 meter, QRP, meaning low power, no frills, SSB kit from India. I think 40 is a great band choice because during the current sunspot cycle, 40 meters is the go-to band day and night. Included in the kit is the basic circuit board completely assembled, adjusted, and ready to go. Also included is the so-called Raduino, which is a combination of an Arduino and an oscillator circuit, and provides a stable, direct digital synthesis VFO. The software in the Raduino can be changed, and there's a display. The price from hfsigs.com, including shipping, is 59 US dollars, and you can use PayPal to pay, although be prepared to wait up to a month for delivery. Now, I've done a fair amount of QRPCW, but have always thought QRP SSB wouldn't work well. So I bought this to find out if QRP SSB really works. In other words, has enough punch to generate good QSOs and to see if this is a good low cost way for new generals to get on HF. The jury is still out on both counts, but early results are looking good. Let's talk a bit about the assembly, building on my last video. The BITX40 comes without a case, so I opted to use the plastic box everything came shipped in as a test bed. In terms of assembly, the job consists of soldering provided leads to the external components and then plugging them into the circuit board. No soldering is required on the board itself. The list of things that need to be soldered and then plugged into the circuit board include the following. A power connector, the BNC antenna connector, a volume control potentiometer, which includes the on-off switch, a tuning control is provided, also a potentiometer. A mic jack. Note that the mic is also included, but without wires or connectors. A speaker slash headphone jack. A connection between the Raduino and the main board. And a push to talk button. Now, putting all this in the plastic case was a bad idea. It was too long to fit into my small table-mounted drill press. The box flexes like crazy and yet is rather brittle, leading to cracking. When I drill the real chassis, I'll have to use someone's floor-mounted drill press. Let's talk about the mechanical part of the project. There are some supplied spacers, screws, and nuts, which I believe are metric. I like to use US specified number 4-40 non-metric machine screws and associated nuts and washers for mounting circuit boards to the case. Here's a diagram of how that's done. Note the screw coming up from the bottom. Many lengths are available. As I didn't have any on hand, I bought a few from Radio Shack, but theirs weren't really long enough. I had a little trouble finding longer ones as Home Depot, True Value, and Ace Hardware here in Montrose don't carry number four hardware in stock. However, thanks to a tip from subscriber Jack Girard, I found them at our local Fastenal store. Now, mind you, I had to buy a pack of 100 of each size I got, so I think I'm now supplied for life. The Raduino board and the display board are shipped plugged into each other. Unfortunately, during shipment, the pins bent enough that the Raduino and the display board will short to each other. I used one of the provided spacers to fix that problem, as shown in my last video. Let's talk about the components. In every case, there's a matching two, three, five, or seven pin connector cable. 
I opted to twist the wires together in an attempt to keep the RFI issues to a minimum. You'll need uh, to do the wire twisting before soldering the wires to the components. Note that for the connectors that have unused wires coming from them, it's very easy to non-destructively remove the wires for later use. With regard to the display, mine came reading blank. Fortunately, there's a way to adjust the contrast. Unfortunately, you have to power down, remove the display, tweak the adjustment, reinstall, power up, and repeat as necessary. I note also that the mounting holes for the Raduino board and the display board do not line up. The microphone is weird to mount. I twisted some uh, hookup wire to create a cable about two feet long. I very carefully kept track of polarity, making sure that the case connector went to the mono connector shield and the other lead went to the tip. I opted to tape the mic to a pen to give it something to hold on to. Now, the provided push to talk button is a circuit board mounted type and not one that can be mounted to the case. So, I used a normally open push button from Radio Shack. When I mount this more permanently, I think I'll attach the push to talk button to the mic holder. The provided audio connectors are circuit board type connectors. In the instructions, BITX40 originator Ashar Farhan, VU2ESE of India, left figuring these out as an exercise for the reader. I struggled with them, at first thinking they were mono connectors, before discovering they really are stereo connectors. I initially wired the headphone slash speaker jack wrong, but was easily able to correct this. Regarding the DC power input, I wish the input power connector were an Anderson power pole connector, but instead it's a pretty standard low power coaxial barrel connector often used in ham radio for low power devices. I created a power cord consisting of the provided connector to a power pole connector. I ended up replacing the power input connector with a much sturdier one. I mentioned in the last video that I smoked a wire rather spectacularly in my early testing, so I added a fuse socket. I'll look for two amp fuses, but right now I have a three amp automotive style in place. It's quite bulky, so I'll look for a better fuse holder for my permanent mounting. I recommend you add a fuse to yours also. Now, note that nowhere is the power input voltage range specified. In amateur parlance, 12 volts is often taken to mean 13.8 volts. Though, since this device can easily be portable, it will have to operate down to 12 volts or less. The provided antenna connector is a female BNC. All my equipment uses PL259s, so when I mount this permanently, I'll use an SO239 instead. The rig's operating frequency is set by a potentiometer. Note the small capacitor mounted on the pot. I note that it is easier to follow the wiring in the photographs rather than the diagram. Oh, and I note that this and the volume pot have small tabs that can go through a hole to keep the pot in place while you turn the knob. So, let's look at some tests. Let's power it up with an ammeter in line and measure the input power on receive. Then we connect a dummy antenna press the push to talk, and record the milliamps. I did the say hello method, but the max current was way less than the one amp the manual says should be normal. I also measured the idle current for the power amplifier using the method outlined in the manual and found the transmit idle current was right where it was supposed to be. Yet, speaking loudly into the mic, did not provide anywhere near the 1 amp or 1000 milliamps of current. I don't have a QRP wattmeter, so I connected my oscilloscope across the antenna output while transmitting into a dummy load. Given that the load is 50 ohms, 
I calculated the power using the power equals voltage squared divided by the resistance, in this case 50 ohms. I found I was getting somewhere around 5 watts out, well down from the promised 10 watts PEP. I also hooked up an audio oscillator to a speaker, turned it way up to 1000 Hz, and measured the results on the O-scope. I measured RMS voltage using the scope. The reading is this one here. I connected my regular antenna, a multiband vertical that performs very well on 40 meters, and got the same results. Bottom line, the output power does not measure up to spec, and this is something I will investigate closely. I've heard that others have had similar issues with their BITX40s, particularly when the kit was recently upgraded from a traditional VFO to the Raduino VFO. I'll follow these issues closely. By the way, the scope's frequency counter closely matches the display readout, so I don't need to go through the process to calibrate the Raduino. So, bottom line, it works well, and I have had some QSOs to prove it, but I am not yet getting full power. My next video will discuss BITX40's usability and how it works on the air. I thought with the low power output I wouldn't get anything, but I was pleasantly surprised. Please click like, please subscribe, check out the Ask Dave playlist and the tip jar. Don't cry over spilt milk, leave a comment, ask a question. Until next time, 73.